very upset with me because I, I didn't record, <laughs> I didn't record that uh, first part of the talk. Uh, so anyway, if you missed that first part of the talk, uh, uh, Okay, here's a question. Recently in the morning, after waking up, I lie in the bed on the back and meditate on that position. And at that time, I contemplate the breath and contemplate that it can stop. May uh, may I... Uh, I have advice on how I can do this. Uh, well, of course, laying on in the back uh, when you wake up, wake up in the morning, uh, you can contemplate uh, that it stop. Uh, but you know, the the body, the sankaras of breathing are very deeply ingrained. And uh, somebody could probably will themselves to stop breathing, but uh, probably not very uh, many uh, people. But you can observe the breath. So when the breath goes out, be, uh, in the beginning, purposely keep it out, because you can do that, uh, especially if you've practiced some deep, slow breathing. Uh, and, and I would suggest doing some deep, slow breathing, and then follow that out breath down to the end, you know, kind of follow those contracting movements of your abdomen or rib cage or chest down to the end to that moment when the breath stops. And then kind of completely relax there and feel that pause. And if you can feel that pause, it might last a little longer. And then you can see the craving to breathe in. Then you will see the, uh, it may not be a fear of death, but the, the desire, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's unconscious, the desire to live and that will to breathe in. So you, actually the moment that you, you decide to breathe in, and so you breathe in. But you can only do that if you willfully hold your breath out. So if you're not really aware of your out breath, and aware of the pause after the out breath and deliberately try to, dele uh, to extend it, then you may not uh, be uh, uh, aware of that, uh, you know, that desire uh, to breathe or the intention to want to, to breathe in. So you can uh, try that. Uh, but the breath is not going to normally stop by itself unless you have some, you know, disease or something else that causes it, like an electric shock or a heart attack or something like that, because it's a, the, the breathing is a very deep-rooted uh, uh, kaya sankara uh, that's normally unconscious, but you can become conscious of the breathing. Uh, and that's why I recommend it to people, because it's very useful. The so next question, I'm thinking that these reflections also help us hold lightly the aggregates. Uh, would this be so? Uh, <clears throat> well, these reflections uh, led us to have the, the sort of detached observation of the aggregate. And knowing that the form aggregate, this body, has its own karma. It was born from the past karma. And it's going to be living according to one's the past karma as well as the current karma that you create. Because you can do foolish things that will cause your premature death. If you go out and get drunk and uh, drive uh, and get in a wreck and kill yourself, okay, that's due to the karma of you know, unwise attention. And the, the karma that you're creating in this uh, life, as opposed to 
you know, just dying of natural old ages, which is uh, both a mixture of past and, and present type of come up and, and the feelings and so on. So yeah, the, the whole meditation on the five aggregates is about learning how to contemplate and observe the five aggregates, knowing that all these are basically have come together from past karma and are, are part of the karma, current karma creating process and will become the, will become the heir of that. That means they go back into the, the, the Sankara Kanda to uh, keep the process going, as I discussed uh, in one of the previous uh, uh, talks I was ex explaining uh, that. So knowing that, you know, all these, uh, you know, and, and if you don't, and if you're having a lot of pain with the aggregates is because uh, in the past you had sowed those seeds for it. And so we have to change the way our attitude toward these five aggregates and the, and the way that we live our life and are accumulating karma in the present because, you know, it's, it's these five aggregates are basically, they're, everything that we are, are composed of. Uh, yeah, I think uh, there was a comment before that a lot of, some people had their mics on or even their videos that were distracting others and people were doing all kinds of things while I was giving a Dhamma talk or Sutta class, you know, talking on their cell phones and fiddling around and, uh, and so that was distracting for others. So uh, it might be best to keep your videos off and also your mics until you want to speak, you know, until, uh, well, now we, we're just writing the questions. So you don't need your mics on uh, at, at the moment. So please turn them off. So you not be, a, you know, causing any unnecessary negative thoughts and others who might be thinking about you. Why is that person uh, doing this or that distraction? Okay. Where do we find the text for these reflections from the Buddha? Every week I practice the four protective meditations, reflecting on the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, and loving kindness. Reflections on the body and death. These meditations are very inspiring. These daily recollections, I don't know which actually sutta they're from, but they're in uh, the Bhavana Society chanting book. And they, they have a source in, in some, in some uh, suttas that the Buddha gave, but I can't quote them at the moment. But, uh, you know, they're, they're in the the Bhavana Society's uh, chanting book, but uh, you probably find them in other Buddhist texts too. Just Google it. Uh, you might, they might give you the source of where, where it was. Uh, yeah. Can you please tell us how to do the correct walking meditation? As in breath meditation, do we have to observe the five aggregates? Well, there's, there's different ways to do walking meditation. Uh, a lot of, you know, different ways. But uh, the way I usually recommend it is actually to coordinate it with the breathing because it helps you to stay more focused and it helps you also to slow down your breathing and to slow down your uh, walking. Uh, so I have people uh, lift the foot up and swing it forward on an in-breath and on the out-breath touch the heel to the ground first and feel the gradual pressing of the uh, foot and toes to the floor and the upper body moving forward all on the out breath. And so you coordinate the steps with the breathing. So the in breath, you're lifting the foot off the ground, swinging it forward, ideally to take at least two or three seconds just for that. And then a minute little pause and then feel that 
touching of the heel to the floor first, and the gradual pressing of the foot and the movement of the body forward all on an out breath. Uh, and you, you know, you, you use that as your main focus of, you know, awareness, just as you would do, you know, with the breathing. And then be aware of the, you know, the various distractions that are trying to pull you away from that. So, you know, the walking body, basically that's the present moment. And just remember that you're walking. Or you can mentally repeat to yourself, lifting, swinging, placing, pressing the foot, and shifting the body forward. Those five kind of what I call the five phases of the walking process. Some people break it into just three phases or maybe even more, but uh, uh, I find that, uh, but you have to walk slow to do that. So it takes some training because people wobble on one foot because you, you know, basically you're on one foot for a few seconds while the other one is lifting up, swinging forward and placing down. So, you know, especially older people might have trouble keeping their balance. But, uh, you know, once you, practice that, it's a, it's a, you know, very nice mindful speed for maintaining the walking. And then, yeah, you just do the meditation as a, as normal, you know, if you feel an itch on your body, be aware of that, or if you feel the urge to look, you know, and just keep the attention focused on the floor and in front of you a few feet. But if you have the urge to look, you know, turn your eyes, you hear something, be aware of that, ah, urge, urge. Uh, urge to look and then you know if it's not really necessary resist that and just stay stay focused or you gotta scratch your head or something and be aware of, be aware of that ah itching itching or thoughts are coming through the back of your mind just be aware of the thoughts but always come back to just uh, you know uh, lifting swinging placing touching pressing or just lifting placing however you might be doing it uh, I had wanted to make a, a video of, you know, the walking and meditation instructions. One time I did uh, at a retreat, but uh, it didn't come out uh, so well, so uh, I didn't really post it. Uh, okay, somebody has uh, put the five recollections up. You can see that probably if you're looking at the chats on Sutra Central, Sujata's website. So you can look at that and uh, you can uh, then uh, look it up on your, on your own if you like. <clears throat> so next question, I've been reading lately about moral dread, theory and moral shame. It's Otapa, I think. Hiri and Otapa, not Opata, Apata, Otapa. Uh, can you discuss what they are and how lay people should utilize these in conjunction with the reflections you just mentioned in a sense of urgency? Well, it's uh, actually, you know, they're used when we are performing, you know, karma. So the the moral dread, the dread, the dread is uh, of the painful consequences that comes about due to uh, breaking the precepts. So to have have dread of that. A lot of people don't have dread of that. Oh, if I slander somebody and you know they find out later, you know. But no, no you have you know you know you see that as really a a uh, negative thing. We have dread of uh, telling a lie because people then won't uh, believe you or they, they'll blame you or any other precept. Uh, you, you, it's the dread of the painful consequences that come about from your action. So in this sense, primarily the negative actions. And then the shame is the shame in doing that. Uh, a lot of people don't have shame. You, you, people are shameless. They just, 
they flagrantly, uh, you know, break the precepts without any sense of shame or any sense of moral dread. Uh, you know, and unfortunately, there's too much of that, right? And uh, so, anyway, this is how it is uh, used. Uh, the sense of urgency in sort of cleaning up your act, so to speak, cleaning up the karma, especially in terms of the, the precepts. Uh, and especially those ones about speech, you know, the, the eight full path precepts and include like slandering and talking about others behind their backs, which would include also telling ethnic jokes and ridiculing people and harsh speech, you know, uh, using harsh speech, four letter words and other, you know, words that hurt people, you know, like a, getting stabbed with a knife, somebody says some harsh speech to you, it's very painful. Uh, so, uh, that, that, and that's the comma, right? So, you know, we're the owner of our comma. So if we do these actions, without the sense of shame or that sense of moral dread, we'll just continue to run up, uh, you know, our karmic scoreboard, so to speak, or, you know, our run up the amount of potential painful re repercussions uh, from that, if we don't have that sense of shame and the moral dread so that's how uh and the, the urgency because again we don't know when we'll die just because you're young now is not a guarantee young people are dying all the time from so many diseases all these things maybe not old age but they're, they're dying of diseases they're dying of in accidents and other things uh and they're dying because of the results of their past karma. Like if they were, became an alcoholic, they started drinking when they were young and they became an alcoholic. If they would have stopped, maybe they wouldn't have, or if they started taking drugs and if they stopped early, maybe they wouldn't have overdosed or died in an accident. But because they continued it, eventually it catches up to them and they might die in an auto accident or some other accident or uh, overdose on drugs or gets shot in a drug deal or whatever it is, you know, uh, you know, <laughs> so many things can happen. So these are, uh, you know, the results of our karma and the sense of urgency that, uh, you know, we don't know when, when these things can happen. Some people have become drug addicts later on in life after they're already 40, 50 years old. They didn't necessarily start young or other, other type of addiction. So, that's why the sense of urgency and uh, is some moral, you know, the sense of shame and moral dread, understanding of the Dhamma is important to help us to avoid getting caught and trapped before it's kind of, you know, too late. Uh, it may never be too late, but in, in that sense of, uh, so, I see my body getting old and now my pets are getting old and I have to spend more time caring for them. So less time to meditate. I find my attitude is not very positive and I regret that I wasted so much time in the past. How should I work on becoming less attached to this whole situation? Actually, I've given talk about renunciation. Uh, so if you have uh, some pets, and one dies, don't get another one, you know? And when that one, and the next one dies, don't get another one. But people keep getting more because they're lonely. You know, they, either they're lonely or some relative said, oh, I have this cat, please take it. You know, I heard your cat die, why don't you take it? And out of compassion you do, but then you're stuck with it. So, uh, you know, <clears throat> one has to, that sense of renunciation. Yeah, we've accumulated lots of things but there's time to let it go. And you don't want to just throw your animals out on the street unless somebody takes, takes them over. But uh, when they die, don't go, go get another one and don't accept any others. 
you know, and then gradually your time will have, instead of having five cats you have to attend to, you have four. So you have some extra time to meditate. Then you have three cats or dogs, and you have more time as, you, as they die off. Or any other things that you have. Or to, to get rid of stuff that you don't use. You know, the, the renunciation, you know, on the Eightfold Path, it's not just becoming a monk or a nun, that's what a lot of people think, but it's renouncing the, all the clutter in your physical life as well as in your mind that, that doesn't do you, really bring you much benefit and is a source of just a lots of worry and uh, wasting your time. So, you know, this is part of the reflection on Dhamma. You know, part of the right understanding and a part of the, the practice of uh, non-greed. So that's, uh, you know, you can't just maybe just get rid of so many things in your life now because you've formed karmic uh, bonds with them. And if you prematurely get rid of them, it may come back to haunt you too. So, but when it naturally happens, like when one of your animals dies, don't get another one. Uh, and uh, other other things, uh, you know, somebody steals your stereo, don't get another one, or whatever. You know, <laughs> things can happen. You know, if that that's what you want, but that's the way you can get more time. Look at now with the with the COVID, right? People they have all this time on their hands, and they could meditate, but you know, then they they also they get distracted. But as I already had mentioned, but. Uh, but also people are learning that, oh, they can live quite, you know, I haven't gone out anywhere, but, you know, I'm, I'm doing okay, you know. The mind is maybe, you can see a lessening of craving or desire in your mind. So you can, you can see that you can live without so many errands and having to go out and do things constantly all the time just because you're bored, you know. So uh, that's where we have to reflect and practice. Next question, I am quite at ease uh, to let go of this body and mind when the moment comes, but my family holds very strong attachment to me. How should I practice in that situation? <laughs> well, yeah, naturally, uh, other family members may have uh, more attachment to to you than you have to yourself, uh, but that may be for their own selfish reasons. Uh, you know, and, but it, it's an accumulated uh, collective type of society's conditioning that uh, you know we, we've had that attachment and you know, especially within families, it's stronger because you've lived so many years. Uh, together and uh, you know some families of course the attachments may be like detachments but uh, so you know and you can't just you know disown them and, and so on uh, but uh, you know you can tell them that you know you, you don't have to go to every family reunion or you don't have to call them every single day to to talk about this or that, you know, you, uh, they, they have to respect your own space, you know, so, uh, just, you know, they have to respect you as you have to respect them, right? And uh, so if they know you're a Dharma practitioner, you know, then they, you know, they should respect your space and uh, know that, you know, you, you may want to go on retreats so and you want to meditate certain times and you don't have to, you know, call each other three, four times a day to talk about things. Uh, and so on. Uh, my mother was quite good at that, you know, even at her old age. And, uh, you know, she loved me very much. And, you know, but, you know, she said, you know, you don't have to call me all the time, you know, and, and, and so on. And she, and she didn't like to burden the burden others with always coming over. That's why she didn't want to live at my brother's house. And, you know, she, she could have, you know, and she wanted to burden the others, you know, with that. Uh, so anyway, yeah, the, you know, family attachments are quite strong, uh, but, uh, you know, there's ways to deal with it, uh, or, you know, uh, so, you know, 
you have to pay some attention to the family members, but don't encourage their, their overly dependence on you and so on. Because the people will take advantage of you if you know you're very kind and compassionate. They'll take advantage of you, even family members. Maybe in, a, in an unconscious way, you know, they, they do. They can't. Uh, so there, somebody has put up the Bhavana Society chanting book. It's a good resource, actually. There's a lot of good things in that uh, book. It is, you know, composed by Bhante G. Uh, so the question, assuming the, uh, is that a question? Assuming that the COVID virus is a living organism, how does the desire to get rid of it affect the karmic consequences? Well, you know, the desire to, uh, you know, get a vaccine, getting a vaccine is, is not against the Buddhist principles. Uh, the vaccine, I don't know if it kills the virus, but it, you know, it might. But the, the Buddha drew a line between uh, sentient objects. That means referring to any of these classes. They don't involve microbes and stuff you cannot see, uh, like viruses and so on. But you know, sentient beings uh, would be regarded as anything in the animal realm or insect realm uh, and so on. So, uh, you know, because even we discussed before, even plants have a kind of consciousness, but the Buddha wasn't, he didn't want people to wantonly destroy even plant life, but he, he knew it was necessary. People had to grow food to eat and they had to cut trees to uh, build houses and so on. So, but he didn't want people to wantonly uh, destroy them. So, you know, he drew a line there. So, you know, taking care of, you know, we try to not get to the disease in the first place, but, uh, you know, having immunity diseases and if, if the body is doing that, that, that's a part of the, you know, evolution too. So I wouldn't worry about too much about, you know, wanting to get rid of uh, having the desire to, uh, you know, to, get rid of the virus uh, or other types of uh, you know, sickness and disease causing things. Is all of the current unrest and protest in the world today the result of individuals' karma or the collective karma of a particular group? Uh, I would say probably both because uh, there's some people who participate in this unrest and protest and there's people that don't. Uh, so what causes one person to go out and join this protest and you know, throw bottles and uh, things like that, uh, antagonize others, that's accumulated from, yeah, either peer pressure from others or, but still it's a decision they make and some people take the decision to do that and other people don't. And that's because of their own uh, development, you know. Uh, uh, so, but, so it's both, it's collective, but it's also individual because ultimately you have the ability to decide. Even there's a mob and they decide, okay, I'm gonna, let's throw bricks in these, through these windows. Some people say, I'm not gonna do that. And they may step back and not do that. But they make it shot anyway if they're in the area, right? So uh, collectively they are with the group, but individually, you know, that's why hanging out in groups uh, is also, you know, can be dangerous uh, if you happen to be in the wrong group at the wrong time. And even though you weren't doing something, you know, actually doing something bad, the, the karma of associating with this kind of uh, people may you know affect you so uh, mosquitoes are parasites that kill many people 
I feel that killing them is just protection against disease. Am I creating negative karma? Uh, well, you could say yes, because, you know, if you take to killing mosquitoes, then you might take to killing deer ticks. And then you might take to killing, you know, snakes and then gradually bigger and bigger uh, things. Uh, but, you know, do the preventive preventive mechanisms to not to get bit in the first place. Uh, and not, you know, here in this country, not all mosquitoes carry diseases because we don't know that. But, uh, you know, anyway, the Buddha also had a classification of kama. Killing something like a mosquito, the comic effect of that is going to be very, very down on a scale. Let's say if there was a scale from one to 10 and the, the heaviest results, karmic results would be one and the, the, or vice versa, but whatever one end of the scale, like killing a human being would be number one or killing even a, you know, a, a, an arahant or a spiritual being or let's say a human being. But, and then, you know, if you kill an animal, it might be down like number two or three. And even the size of the animal, if you kill somebody who's just a, let's say, some very well-known famous person, somebody who's very intelligent, that's going to, because it's the memory in your mind, actually, that's the karma. It's the intention. So the intention, let's say, to kill some very well-known famous person, you know, you've got to, you got to contemplate that pretty seriously, right? Because, you know, if you kill somebody well known, there's going to be a lot of people looking for you. So it takes more premeditation to carry out that complicated kind of killing. So it's going to have a heavier, heavier karmic effect. But then you go down the scale, you know, if somebody killed, let's say, a so homeless person or somebody, okay, it's still killing, but the karmic effect in terms of, it depends on why you kill them and so on. And also the, the premeditation that goes into it. So the Western law is very much in accordance with the law of karma. So first degree premeditated murder carries a, the heaviest sort of penalty. Right? And then second degree accidental death and then manslaughter, all the lesser penalties. And it goes down to animals and you kill an elephant or a tiger or some you know, or the, and the insects are probably, the mosquitoes are probably down at number 10. If number one was a human being, mosquitoes are probably down at number 10. Uh, because, you know, of that. Now you may agree or not agree with that, but each person has to sort of draw their own uh, line uh, for that, you know. Because the Buddha said unintentional killing is is not a karmic action. So uh, if you don't have the intention to kill, of course, if you deliberately swat mosquitoes, there, there's going to be an intention to kill. But again, uh, you know, there's not a really a lot of hatred behind it. I mean, there is a kind of hatred, but uh, because they're doing something to you you don't like, uh, causing you pain of the itch, or uh, the fear of, you know, uh, getting sick. Um, does the Metta Sutta say refrain from harming all living creatures, seen and unseen? Uh, it, uh, Metta Sutta says, I'd have to uh, re-scrutinize it, but uh, it, normally, yes, and intentionally, but whether that refers to the bacteria and all that, again, each person's got to draw their own line, you know? And if you want to go that far, not to use vaccines or anything else, okay, but I think the Buddha would call that uh, one extreme because he even mentioned that. He, uh, there were some ascetics at the time of the Buddha that carried a little broom and they, they swept the ground in front of their foot so they would uncover any 
tiniest little ant that might be crawling underneath the dirt or under the leaves and sweep it to avoid killing them. And the Buddha criticized them for being overly extreme because that's, it's really impractical to sweep it. every step in front of you, you know, when you're walking, you're not going to go very fast. Uh, so uh, that's what he mentioned about uh, the, you know, you know, the, 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 the extreme about being too obsessed with uh, things that disturb your mind more than the karmic consequence of being overly disturbed by those things and obsessed with it as opposed to just you know being more natural but being mindful and not not deliberately wanting to uh, ca cause harm but knowing that you know there is going to be harm and uh, you know the world is the world and it comes and goes and maybe that's the karma of insects that they're going to be killed you know you, there's also a way of seeing that uh, so you know there's different ways that you can uh, you know, reflect on that. But in the end, it has to come down to your own, uh, you know, moral sense and so on. But deliberately putting out poison, you know, to kill uh, things, there's, you can try other treatments, try, try other things that maybe not so grossly flagrantly, uh, uh, you know, killing these uh, types of creatures. I will do preventative treatment around my yard and house. Thanks, Monte. I really don't want to kill any living being. Uh, yeah, right. We try to do preventive uh, things, but in the course of it, uh, things may be, get killed. But as I mentioned, those small little things, where there's not that uh, hatred and ill will behind, uh, behind it, then, uh, you know, I wouldn't... Uh, overly uh, worry about it too much, you know, but we do, we do what we can, you know, like if you know that there's a nest of mice in a pile of rubbish, and you deliberately set it on fire, okay, then there's some, you know, malice there, but if you try to get the mice out of the <laughs> pile of sticks or, you know, make some noise and shoo them out and then set it on fire, uh, you know, at least you're, you're trying to uh, practice some, you know, some compassion. So, anyway, friends, uh, yeah, it's getting, uh, time is getting away from us. So, uh, and that looks like that's the end of the question. So, um, anyway, there's a lot of good questions there. And uh, so, <clears throat> now we'll get ready to have our uh, meditation. So we'll take a short uh, few minutes uh, to use the restroom, take a drink of water or just stand up and stretch. And then we'll come and we'll do a few stretches as we, do, as we normally do and then uh, have our uh, meditation. Okay? Okay. See you in a few minutes.
Okay, friends, uh, we're back now. And uh, for those who like, we'll do a few stretches before our meditation. find a place to stand. Just try to stand straight. Feel your feet pressing the floor. Relax the shoulders, feel the arms and hands hanging at the sides. And feel the clothing touching the skin in different places. Feel the head balanced on top of the neck. You start to mentally feel that outline of the standing body. <clears throat> and then begin some deep, slow breathing. Try to take three or four seconds, just to slowly breathe in, expanding your abdomen, rib cage, and upper chest. Hold the air in the lungs, two or three seconds, to allow the oxygen to get into the bloodstream, carry it out to all the cells of the body, and feel the relaxing contraction of the out-breath. So ride the contracting out-breath down to the end, to feel the last bit of air go out. And then the next in breath. Gradually bringing the mind into the body. Okay, on the next in breath, raise the arms over the head, interlock the fingers, turn the palms up, straighten the arms, stretch your head back, and arch your lower back spine a little bit. On the out breath, turn the palms down, touch the top of your head. Again, in breath, palms up, straighten the arms, stretch the head back, arch the lower spine. Out breath, touch the top of the head. On the third time, hold that upward stretch longer. Feel all the sensation and release the fingers on the out breath, arms back to the sides. Relax. Just close the eyes and feel those inner subtle vibrations. And just remember the present moment of standing, standing, standing. The okay, next, on an in breath, push up on the toes and raise the arms over the head and stretch up. Uh, 
out breath, bring the arms back to the side, heels back to the floor. Use the breath to help lift and lower the body. On the in-breath, imagine you're blowing up a helium balloon, the body raises up. The out-breath, letting out the helium, body comes back down. Once more, in-breath. Stretch. Out. Relax, especially feel the increased sensation, vibration in the hands. Subtle pulsation. Next, we'll do side bending using one arm at a time. So on the in-breath, raise the left arm up. Try to keep the bicep close to the side of your head. On the out-breath, bend over the right side as far as you comfortably can. In-breath, lift up. Two more times to the same side, out breath. In. Out. Mm. On the out breath, lower that arm. Next in breath, raise the other arm. On the out breath, bend over the left side. In. Out. In. Out. Mm -hmm. The out breath, lower that arm. Just relax. Just gently close the eyes. Feel the body. Feel that increased aliveness, sensations of the body. present moment awareness. The vibrations of the four elements. Four elements are just basically the vibration of the cells and atoms. Some feeling like solid, some feeling fluid, some feeling heat, others producing motion. Mm -hmm.
I just remember standing, standing. Standing. And then the last exercise, head turning from right to left. So on the in breath, turn the head to the right as far as you comfortably can. Try to look over your right shoulder. Turn your eyes also to the right. Focus on some spot over on the right or behind you. Out breath, turn the head 180 degrees back to the left. Just concentrate into the neck vertebrae, imagining, feeling them loosening up. And try to look over the left shoulder, turn the eyes to the left. In breath, back to the right. Out breath left. Once more to each side. Let the head stop in the center. Just close the eyes. Feel the whole body. Feel that aliveness of the whole body. Feet pressing the floor, the hands and arms at the sides. Clothing touching the skin on different places. Head balanced on top. Okay, now go ahead and come back to your seats for the sitting meditation. <clears throat> Let's try to sit in a comfortable posture. If you're sitting in a chair, then try to keep both feet flat on the floor. Try to sit up straight, not leaning against the back of the chair. Yeah, I'm going to be turning off the, my video. Just try to follow the verbal instructions, guidance. Gently close the eyes. First of all, just feel the weight of the body pressing the seat. So you feel both buttocks where they're pressing the seat. Try to notice the right one, the left one. Points of contact. Producing sensation. Producing consciousness. And then feel your feet pressing the floor. Try to feel your, the heels 
the balls of the feet and the toes, pressing the floor. And feel your hands and fingers touching. If you could notice the outline of your thumbs and other fingers, notice the subtle pulsations, tingling sensations. And feel the shoulders, relax the shoulders, and feel the weight of the arms hanging from the shoulders. Feel where the clothing touches the skin of the shoulders or arms. All these are just the tactile earth element vibration sensation. And gently kind of straighten up the, the back and spine a little bit more if you can. Try to find the center of gravity of the head and spine over the hips. Kind of that tipping point where the body could either move forwards or backwards. And try to maintain that perfect upright posture and feel the head balanced on top of the neck or spinal column. And feel some sensations on your face, skin stretched over the face. Feel the lips touching together, the upper lip touching the lower lip. And try to feel the tongue laying in the mouth where it touches your teeth or gum. There's any saliva, the water vibration. The tongue, the earth element laying in the moist water element of saliva. Now take a few deep, slow breaths and try to feel the sensation of the air moving through the nostrils. Imagine the air coming into the nostrils and going into the lungs. So try to take a deeper breath and hold the air in the lungs a few seconds to feel that the sensation of holding the air in. And feel that relaxing contraction of the out breath, 
Again, following the contracting out breath down to the in. Feel the last bit of air go out of the nostrils or out of the lungs. Just continue to take a few more deep, slow breaths like that. Knowing that this body lives on the oxygen going in and out of the lungs. It feeds the cells of the body with oxygen. That breathing would have stopped for more than a few minutes. This body would start dying. And if you can, on the next out breath, you're up feeling the breath going out, just riding that contracting sensation down to the end, and then just pause. Feel that pause after the out breath. And try to delay the next in breath. Just feel that relaxation of the pause. Just watch the pause until you, you see that intention or urge to want to breathe in. And then naturally breathe in again. And hold the breath in a few seconds to feel that pause. That life force of so the in breath causes the life force and looting of the body, the out breath, and the breath stops. The opposite happens, death process begins. After the next out breath, just discontinue the deep breathing. Feel the effects of that in the body and mind and actually just try to feel your eyes in the sockets. Just feel the eyes resting in the sockets and the eyelids stretched over the eyeballs. The subtle sensation. Just be aware of sitting, sitting. And from that point behind the eyes, you can try to just mentally feel the outline of the sitting body. That sense of the feet pressing the floor underneath or the buttock. The hands touching somewhere in the middle of the body. Clothing touching the skin on different places. The head balanced on top. This is sitting, breathing body exactly as it is. Just tune back into the shorter breaths. Try to be alert for that intention to breathe in. Just delay that the next in breath slightly a bit until you feel that urge to want to breathe.
And after breathing in, hold the breath in for a few seconds, and then you'll be able to see the urge to let out the breath. Holding the breath out too long is also painful. So the intention to want to let out the breath, the desire to breathe out arises. You can notice that and feel the out breath. So after the out breath, there's an intention to breathe in again. And after the in breath, there's an intention to breathe out again. Because normally we never see those intentions to breathe. Because we never really focus on it. This is a training exercise. In noticing the subtle intention. That unconscious desire to breathe. So the unconscious desire for the ego to live, for the body to live. like looking down through a microscope, kind of just turning up the power of the microscope to feel the subtler details of the breathing process. The subtle movements of the in-breath, the pause, subtle movements of the out breath and the pause. So with the breathing also, there's the air vibration, the sense of movement, the air coming in and out, the air vibration. It's also mixed in with the earth vibration, the touch of the clothing against the skin. The rib cage touching the skin. It's balancing mindfulness and concentration. Concentration is the ability to, to follow each movement of the breathing. But the mindfulness is the alertness for any possible distraction. And noticing the different subtle movements. And being alert for any thoughts arising in the mind any urges or wanting. Be mindful of any hindrances arising like drowsiness.
the in-breath, the brief pause, the out-breath, the brief Your mind is calm enough, focused enough. You can also just reflect in this two process, the body-mind process. Body elements, sitting and breathing. The mind elements of the consciousness, knowing it. the witness or the mind with its desires telling the body to move or if you hear any sounds and the perceptions arising or Thoughts about the sounds, the mind process, the mind-body process, the mind cognizing sounds. And there might be feelings there, pleasant, painful, neutral feelings, or any spin-off thought. All the five aggregates are right there and observing the breathing body process. As the samatha and the vipassana together, samatha is the calm state of focused awareness. The vipassana is seeing the five aggregate process in its flow of impermanence, changing vibration, changing feeling perceptions, mental activity, moments of consciousness.
Anytime the mind spaces out or gets drowsy, take a few deep breaths to help waken up, get reconnected in the body. Or if there's too many thoughts, do some deep, slow breathing to help slow the mind down, to bring it back into the body. Using mindfulness and right effort to balance. The calmness and the alertness. Stay alert, awake, moment by moment. Feeling the in-breath and the pause, the out-breathing and the pause. Those brief pauses between the breaths, you can get a sense of that vibration of the present moment awareness, that stillness, being. between thoughts. It's difficult to think in the pauses between the breaths.
detached, cultivating this detached, onlooking awareness to this breathing body. You can contemplate the three periods of time, this body and mind came from the past karma. In the present moment, it's creating more karma. In the future, it'll be experiencing the results of this present karma. It's the karma that keeps everything in motion. There's no real owner or controller to this process of the body and mind. Consciousness is just a detached witness. Even the sense of I is just produced by the mental activities through feeling, perception, volition. Sense of I is created and maintained. Consciousness thinks it owns this I. The I owns the consciousness. If you can maintain that detachment and just observing these five aggregates, cultivating the insight that this is not me, not mine, not myself. And the sense of I just slowly starts fading away into the background.
stay alert when any pains or unpleasant sensations arise. Be aware of the urge, the thoughts about them. Just happens by itself. The past conditioning. In the last couple of minutes, you can also reflect on the five daily recollections, this five aggregate body-mind process, physical body subject to decay, subject to being diseased, that's its natural nature. Ultimate destination is death. The time of death is unknown. It's also due to karma. You could live to a long old age or some past karma could arise and cause premature, untimely death. And everything dear and delightful, even this body or bodies of others, our material possessions, will change and vanish. They come into our life, they disappear out of our life without our wanting it. On its own terms, they come and go. We're the owners of our karma, born from our karma. We inherit our karma, abide supported by our karma. Whatever karma we shall do, whether wholesome or unwholesome, of that 
we become the air. What perceptions come into the mind on hearing that sound? Sambe Dhamma Anatati Yada Panyaya Pasati Atani Bindati Dukhi Isamagu Visu All conditioned things, the five aggregates of this body, mind, and world are impermanent. They arise only to pass away. And if we cling to impermanent things with ignorance and stress and suffering arise, and all the dhammas, Conditioned dhammas, the five aggregates, as well as the unconditioned dhamma, the deathless element, are without any owner or controller or indwelling entity. They're all not self. When one understands these three characteristics with the eye of wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with suffering. This is the path to purity, to freedom. And thus spoke the Buddha, the awakened. Okay, now friends, as we've done before, we'll spend a Last few minutes sending out thoughts of metta to 
ourself, our loved ones, and all other beings, using the breathing as a help for that. So let's take a few more deep, slow breaths. After breathing in, hold the air in the lungs <clears throat> several seconds to imagine or feel that life force charging up the blood and cells of the body with the vital force which is a healing energy, present moment awareness, healing energy, even on the out breath. So you feel the relaxation of the body and mind on the long out breath. You just take a few more deep, slow breaths like that. Just imagine those holding in the breath a few seconds being that metta, sending it to your own body and mind, and that present moment awareness while you're holding in the breath. In the out-breath, the healing relaxation of the out-breath. So that sending metta to your own body and mind. Just doing deep, slow breathing. Then begin on the out breaths, begin radiating these meta vibrations or these healing body vibrations, thought vibrations, friendliness, best wishes. Just imagine radiating those outward back home to your family members, and loved ones, friends, colleagues at work. And if you care to, if you'd like to join me in sending a few long out breaths of metta vibrations to my dear mother who passed away yesterday morning. Her mind still might be in the transition zone between this life and the next life. Just sending her those peaceful vibrations, wishing that all these peaceful vibrations could help guide her mind to the right place appropriate to her karma, to be able to carry on her good karma in another life, her path to ultimate freedom. Also sending some of those same thought metta vibrations to Prashant's mother who also will meet the same fate at some point in the near future or anybody else you have in mind that you know. And then just continuing expanding out those metta vibrations, all other living beings throughout the whole earth, the world. So with the idea that may all living beings in the whole world, whether living near or far away, visible or invisible, born or yet to be born, the weak or the strong, the rich or the poor, may all living beings be well, peaceful and wise, may all living beings be free from excessive attachments, anger, hatred, ill will, fear and ignorance. May all beings be able to hear the teachings of the Dhamma, to learn and practice meditation. 
help free their minds from confusion and suffering. May all beings be able to live peacefully and harmoniously together, understanding the karmic interrelated nature of all things. May all beings be well, peaceful, and wise. May all beings be well, peaceful, and wise. Just like a mantra reverberating throughout space. Well, peaceful and And I invite you to join me in chanting the word sadhu three times slowly. An in breath, chanting on a long out breath. Sadhu. Sadhu Place the hands at the edge of your knees and on the next in breath, stretch the head back and arch your lower spine. Pull the hands against the knees, arch back more. Feel all the sensation. Lift the head up on an in breath. And press the chin to the top of the chest on the out breath. Okay, show hand to the face. Okay, that transition. And lift the head up on the in breath. And relax and smile on the out breath. Bhante, I wish your mom a lot of peace during her transition. Thank you very much. I'm sure she uh, she will uh, find it. My good wishes for her, Bhante. Thank all of you for your kind thoughts. Yes, Bhante, on one hand, it is good that she is released of all that suffering that she was going through so that that part is is good in a way as you said earlier yes and for those who may not have heard that you know she was already she would have been 102 years old next so 
Yes. You know, she's well beyond her time to live in this world in terms of the physical body and so on. So uh, that's why I say, you know, it's it's joyful actually that you know I rejoice in her her uh, merits and uh, have mudita that uh, she's been released from the suffering of the physical body and hopefully will get a much you know a, another pleasant body whatever form or karma uh, takes we don't know uh, but you know if she's up there even right now looking down here. You know, I'm sure she would feel the energy going her way. Yes, Bhante. And it was a blessing that she went peacefully too. Yes. 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 Again, that, that's due to the karma. Some people could, uh, of course, when they, when they go unconscious, you know, in the last day or two, the person is gradually dying like that. You, they're unresponsive, so you don't actually probably know what's in their mind. They could be having all kinds of different thoughts, or they could be very peaceful, or hard to know. Yeah. That, that, that would be due to how they prepared themselves, you know, how, how they prepared themselves for it. There's so many strong memories. When you lose contact to the, the physical surroundings around you, then all you have is your unconscious mind with all of its accumulated memories and fears and, and so on. And whatever strong things come up like that, the mind could grab at one of those and, and that's what would take it to a place to be reborn. So if you don't have control of your thoughts and these all these random bad memories come up, that's what takes the mind to a bad, uh, unfortunate destination. You know? And so you could say that the whole practice of Dhamma is about preparing for that moment of death in a, in a way, you know, in order to have those kind of, you know, access to those uh, good thoughts and having weakened the power of the negative ones through one's practice prior. Don't wait to the end. You have to start doing it before that. Okay, friends, so thank you for uh, participating and joining and sharing your, all your good vibrations with, uh, with everybody and my mother. And, and uh, so we'll, we'll meet again. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you. Remember, mindfulness today keeps dukkha away. And Namo Buddhaya. Namo Buddhaya, is, to me, I, I see it as this is the vibration of present moment awareness you know, that we always have underneath the surface of our active mind, ego mind, there's this ocean of wisdom of, you know, the pure awareness, which to me is the, you know, the vibration of Buddha, Buddha's mind or whatever else you might call it. But anyway, being a Buddhist, you know, call it Buddha's mind. Okay. Thank you, Bhante. Okay. Thank you. Keep you well and happy, Bhante. May she receive the blessing. Uh, hello, Fabiana. Had you heard that news about my mom before? No, I just heard now. Oh, yeah. So I feel here in my heart and I hope she receives all the blessings um, for the good life she had and uh, for your life too. <laughs> Yeah, we all, we all, we all receive what we've sown, you know. That's the wonder about the common, you know. <clears throat> oh, Klaus, I want to uh, ask you something. Hmm? Klaus, yeah, yeah. Well, I got a letter from Saskia at House Distiller, yeah. and she she's asking me to about the retreat next Zoma. Yes. And, you know, it's kind of iffy, you know, because who knows what's going to happen next summer, especially with America, this crazy situation. I mean, <laughs> nobody wants us Americans over there. I don't know if I'll be able to do that. Hmm? But they asked to, to send a, you know, a write-up for the retreat in June, right? In June. Mm. It helps to still it. Mm. Close? Yes. 
<laughs> is that retreat in June? Right? In June? Yeah. June 17. June 17. Until July 1st, I guess, or something. No, no until June... 27. 20, okay. Yeah, so... Uh, Maybe we can do... Uh, you can come online. <laughs> yes. Or maybe yes. things will improve by then. Who knows? You know. Actually, some monks out in California, they might be doing a, an almsgiving and a merit transfer ceremony for my mother, but I'm going to join them on Zoom for that. I cannot travel to California now. Um, That's nice. Yeah. Okay, but, friends, uh, we'll, uh, I'm going to sign off now. So, Thank you, Bhante. Uh, you're you're right. all very welcome. Yes, all thank the you. best to you.